chapter 6. And let me say, uh, please, please invite someone next uh, Sunday. And not just next Sunday, but uh, any other Sunday. How many have ever before uh, you've heard a preacher preach and you walk away and you say, man, he had something to say. He had been in his Bible. Well, uh, there's a reason for that. Amen. It takes time to study. When I was in middle Georgia, we were talking to a fellow, and you could tell he was just overwhelmed with, with work and with uh, the church. And uh, it takes time to study, friend, to get a hold of God and find the Bible. And so uh, this morning, I want to give you a few reasons on uh, why a deacon, uh, why there's a need of a deacon. Now, look, we're in an area, and I know some on Facebook are totally going to, if it gets out, are going to disagree with me, and that's okay. They're entitled to uh, but we're in an area that is uh, put a, if you will, a hold or a no on having deacons. Matter of fact, many of the churches that I have pastored, uh, they did not have deacons and uh, they had trustees. And uh, so one preacher asked me one time, he said, you know why that's like that, don't you? He said, uh, you, nobody knows, the deacons get too much authority and they give the pastor a problem, they take over the church. Uh, that's not going to happen here, okay? I promise you, it's not going to happen here. Uh, but what a sad reason not to obey the scriptures. Now, who is, I got a question before we preach, who is the authority in the church? I want to know. Somebody tell me. Amen. The collective body. That means everyone who is a faithful tithing member, you're in this, you're a saved, faithful member. You take a vote. That is the overall authority. Now, I'm an under-shepherd. Everything rises on leadership, rises or falls on leadership. It's hard to go in a conference without somebody leading you in the conference. Amen? Uh, but I'm not. Those men in those churches, they can have those philosophies. They can do that. Uh, but I'm going to stick just to the scriptures. Amen? I believe God had a reason for deacons, ordained deacons, ordained preachers. There's a reason for it. And I want to try to expose a few of those this morning. Uh, while we're reading, uh, before we go, in, uh, before we start reading, there's a miracle here in verse 5. It said that Satan pleased everyone. Amen. So if you, you got something that can please everybody, brother, you better ray it. You better grab it. Amen. Because uh, I can tell you two things the devil will get in quick. Number one, the heating and air condition. I see most of the time I see some fanning on this side and some freezing on this side. Uh, I like it cold, to be honest with you. Uh, just cool. But the devil's always going to try to get into something. And I think that our churches are suffering from ignoring men who are qualified to be ordained. And I want to look in our script, in scriptures this morning, Acts chapter 6. And in verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Here's somebody arguing. You see it? Oh, my, my. Look at uh, Against the Hebrews. Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, uh, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Watch this. Whom we may appoint over this business. Father, we love you today. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people and I pray, God, that you would help us as we uh, begin to preach uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Help us as we look in the Bible, uh, Lord, to only preach that which is pleasing in thy sight. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us as we uh, go through the day. I pray, God, that you would uh, move in the hearts of men and women in this uh, church. Bless our upcoming Thanksgiving service, Lord. I pray many of us would invite people and bring people, and I pray it would be a a wonderful day uh, in the house of God, not only for us at Thanksgiving as a church family, but it would be a springboard to uh, meet with our own personal families. And we just want to thank you again that we're in a country that has the freedom and the liberty to worship God. And I'm grateful for that this morning. Bless the word of God. We'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you heard it here. I'm not, uh, 
is hitting rumor, but there are re what I want to call requirements for deacons, amen? And I think we ought to, uh, someone, most of the time you and I refer to them as qualifications, amen? I'm going to use the word requirement for the outline this morning, okay? But there are some things that God does require a deacon to have. And first of all, what, what is the role of a deacon? Somebody asked. Well, somebody has to lead the place, amen? There's going to be decisions. There's going to be things. And in this case, you got somebody murmuring uh, because uh, they thought that the disciples, they thought the disciples wasn't doing their job. And uh, so they begin to argue, amen? And uh, boy, what a sign of immaturity when we begin to argue in the house of God, amen? I'll not be no murmuring and complaining and arguing in God's house, amen? If there's a spirit of unity, if we're all headed in the right direction, uh, like brother was preaching this morning, submitting yourselves in one to another in the fear of God, there ought to be a willing submission in our lives, friend, to do what's right. Now, we'll all get our say-so in, in a meeting like this morning. And any time we go into a conference, I honestly believe I don't have any problem answering a question, friend. When a man can't answer a question, there is a problem. Now, if you're out of order, I'll tell you very quickly. Just ask my wife. I will tell you very quickly, won't I, Josh? If you're out of order, I'll let you know it. Uh, and, and I've had some men get out of order before, and women get out of order in the service. That doesn't mean you can't ask a question or you can't voice your opinion if it stays to the, if you're a voting, tithing member, you can say something. If you don't tithe and you're stealing from God, you can't say a word, amen? I mean, that's just how it is. I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible says. Malachi 3, will a man rob God? How will he rob God? In tithing offerings. Malachi 3 is clear as a bell. Uh, so if you're a voting member, then you have a say-so in this church. And I want to make that clear as a bell. Uh, we ought to not have a dictatorship in a church. That's when one man gets up and everybody does everything he says. Nobody looks into the Word of God. He's got a free reign, and that's called a dictatorship. We don't have that here, amen? I don't want that, don't never want that, uh, because we want God's will. We want to stay the Bible. Now, we ought to stick to the Word of God. But here there was an argument going on amongst, uh, if you will, two different groups and in the midst of their arguing, one is saying that the, the, uh, <clears throat> the widows are being neglected. Now look, we ought to take care of widows in the church, amen? Let me just pause and say that. Uh, but I, it's sad to say, why would the church have to come along and take care of widows if their children and their family was taken care of? Them? What happened? I lost some of you. That's how it ought to be, brother. The family ought to take care of family, but there was a reason God come in and they were being neglected. There was widows and God saw fit that the church would take care of the widows. And I'm a firm believer, if we've got a church member that is in need and there are a widow or they don't even have to be a new widow and we can meet that need and help that individual, we ought to do it. Praise God, we ought to do it. But these were getting neglected on, if you will, not financial need, just maybe spiritual need, maybe a spiritual instruction when one's husband dies and maybe they're not used to doing things, they were seeking advice, that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that, amen? Uh, the, the disciples come along and they said, hey, look, uh, we're all the time. What a, prob what a good problem to have, needing to be able to minister to people. We need that here. I mean, they were all the time having to stop and give advice and help people and Gear people in the room. We don't have that problem around here. I hope we will one day. It'd be good to have. Uh, but there were so many needs that they said, look, we can't meet all these needs. We can't be leaving the Word of God and, and, and addressing every little, in our day and time, every little text, every little phone call. We can't be doing that. We've got to have time to study, friend. We've got to have time to take the Bible, learn the Bible, and preach the Word of God to people. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look out seven men. Now, you don't have to have seven deacons, friend. Um, I don't know. I'm not saying you can't have seven deacons. But you've got to have some deacons. Hey, man, I honestly believe that. We need deacons. Now, we're only going to have ones after this morning, but I'm praying God would raise some young men up that would, that would step up to the plate and say, Preacher, uh, and live right. And then the church, now, now, now 
get this, it's, it's to the church and the pastor to look out among who? The congregation. There's a hint there. Uh, you ought to, when you go to look and you ought to look at somebody that's been around a little while and proved himself for a little while, amen. We just don't go through the act of somebody coming in with a fat wallet and a nice car and a big business and put them in as a deacon. That's happened a lot of times, friend, and it's nothing but a mistake. It's not right. It's not scripture to put a man in authority because of it, the, the, the thickness of his wallet, amen. I'd rather have somebody that's poor as can be and rich with God and loves God and loves the Bible and spiritually uh, submitted to the Lord Jesus. That's the man I want in office. And sometimes I just came back from middle Georgia and uh, we had one there. And I'm telling you, friend, he was both. This man is a multi, multi millionaire. And uh, when I left Calvary, he came to the parsonage and stood in the uh, uh, yard and cried, just wept. He said, Preacher, please, please, please do not leave. He said, Take a two week vacation, take your family somewhere. He said, I will personally pay for every bit of it. He said, But do not leave. We'll only leave the, lose these few families. Uh, our church is growing, it's moving in the right direction. So you can't have somebody that is wealthy, friend, and spiritual too. I want to say that. The man met me at, uh, while I was down in preaching in middle Georgia this week and said, Preacher, I just want you to know my family and I really love you and we're grateful for your ministry when it was down here. So we need good men. So it doesn't matter what a man's got or what he's accomplished in life, but it matters what he's got and what he's accomplished in the things of God in the church. Uh, uh, Paul says it this way, he needs to be full of faith. But the requirements, first of all, and, and you can turn here, I'm not going to read them all. If you want to read them all, you can. I'm going to quote them to you, uh, but let, not let the food get cold. Amen? But the requirements of a, of a deacon, first of all, number one is this. I didn't say it, I didn't write it, God did. He's got to be the husband of one wife. And let me say this, it does not mean one wife at a time. The word is uno in the Greek. And what it means is this. I was asked a good question yesterday uh, by some people. And they didn't have a clue that I was up and preaching on this this morning. One of them asked me this. What do you do with people who's had a bumpy road in their marriage? And maybe they divorced, preacher. And they got remarried. They came back and, and got right with God. And one left the other, but they had a bad year in their marriage, and they got remarried again. The same person remarried the same person. They had only been married really one time, if you will, in the eyes of God. I don't have a problem with that individual. Y'all may, that's fine, but I'm the pastor. I don't have a problem with that individual, amen? I don't have a problem who people who have been through horrible divorces Hey, look, don't sit back and throw your long finger at somebody for being through a divorce. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they've done. You don't know what they went through. And it's so easy for people to sit back and point their long critical finger at people and say, you should have done this, you should have. You don't have a clue what you should have done. You wasn't there, amen? But we've got a crowd, friend. They want to hammer that road all the way down and just hit it all they can. And uh, I want to say this, when it comes to the qualifications of the pastor or a deacon, a man, not a woman, there's no deaconettes, amen? I love you ladies, but I'm going to tell you the Bible, amen? God didn't make it that way. God put it in the book for the man, and the man is the head of the house. Ladies, go ahead and write it down. He's the head of the house. If you're running your house, you're out of order, Amen. I'm telling you that because I love you. God ordained the man to be the head of the home. Somebody say amen right there. I mean, I've pastored some and they inherited deacons and he wasn't a deacon. His wife was running the order. Last church I pastored, I literally had to tell a man, you put her in order or I'm going to. I did, Brother Ephraim. I didn't want to. Somebody need to put her in order. We put her in order. I said, don't you let the Lord hit, don't let the door hit you on your blessed assurance on the way out if you can't treat people no better than that. We all ought to be courteous about how we treat one another in the house of God. And how we, here we got an argument going on 
And the disciples say, hey, look, we're going to have to find somebody who's qualified to deal with these problems because all they were doing was listening to a lot, a lot of the time, listening to a lot of things that needed to be helped, they needed to be corrected, but they were getting to the point that all they were, the church was growing so much, all they were doing was listening to problems and it was taking them away from the Word of God and they couldn't preach like they needed to. They couldn't study. They'd get up and tell stories, sound like a modern day church to me. And so they come out and said, seek ye out seven men. Seek ye some men that, that, can, uh, that can be put over this business. Now look, the deacon's supposed to be the husband of one wife. Now that is a major requirement, but I'll tell you this much. I'd rather have four smoking deacons who've been divorced nine times than not have the qualities that I'm fixing to mention under this. That is an important one. That is an important one, not being married. God put it there, and we're supposed to only be the husband of one wife. It's in the Bible. You can read it. Let me give you that text if you didn't hit it. That'll be found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You're welcome to look at it. It's in more, more chapters in the Bible. God made the leadership that way, folks. I didn't. Chuck hadn't been married but one time, and his wife's in glory this morning. Now, Chuck, let's say uh, 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 God sends Chuck a lady in here. He's free to marry her, amen, no matter if he's a deacon or not. Chuck, what are you smiling for? But, uh, but I'm saying it's okay. God's God, uh, it's been done God's way. That's all right. Well, here's the other one I want you to see. Number one, and, and I, I'm not going to go through all these. You can find these in Second uh, First Timothy three, and you can find them in the book of Acts. He's got to be of good good behavior. I mean, this guy can't have a bad attitude against life. He's got to be of good behavior, and he's got to have a head, a, a mind on his on his head, uh, a mind in his head that he can. He's logical. He don't always out here just doing everything that's contrary to scriptures. He's got to be of good behavior. And, and, and God not only said that, but he said this. He can't be a novice. Now look, fellas, don't get mad at me, but you can't have a bunch of 20-year-old deacons. God said that. Now I will tell you this much. I've met some young men who are 20-year-old that are a whole lot further along in God's uh, will and in the word than some of them 60 and 80 years old. I know some 20-year-olds, buddy, that walk with God, that love God. And if it wasn't for that one word uh, identifying their age, a novice, I'd put them on as a deacon in a second. Because our young people, we do have some young people who love the Lord and who will do what God wants them to do. But right here, they can't be a novice. In other words, and it's not really primarily to God hitting at one's age, rather to that God is hitting at one's experience. In other words, if you're 20, you only know so much. It's not your fault. It's not uh, God designed it that way. And there's just some things in life that you haven't learned. Uh, and, and it's going to take time. That's one reason, friend. I personally, uh, it would be hard for me to sit under a 20, 19, 20-year-old 20 pastor who doesn't have a family who's not had some experience in his life because it's going to be hard to pastor people, friend, if you haven't had some experience. Somebody help me with an amen right there. How can a man keep his house in order when he doesn't even have a home? Amen? Well, we got them all over, going all over. I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm just trying to stick to the Bible. Now, look here. Not only is he to be a good behavior, not a novice, but here we go. Must have a good report without. In other words... Chuck, I ain't had nobody come to me squealing about not, not, uh, not putting you on as a deacon. I've not heard one negative word. I don't think I've ever had that blessing before in a church. I'm going to be honest with you. I've put on deacons. But I don't believe I've ever had that one before. In other words, this fellow needs a good, he's got to have a good reputation, not only within the church, but outside the church. Well, I can tell you this much. I know this man does. He's got to have one of good report. Now, here's one, not double-tongued, Josh. You know what that means? That means hearing something, running around, telling everybody about it. How do you benefit, Misty, from somebody going through something bad? Like, it'd be like you coming and telling me something that happened to you that was really bad and personal, and then I'm running around here and telling everybody. 
God ain't in that. That's nothing but a bunch of hypocrisy and a bunch of filth, isn't it? Well, God says right here, if you're going to put a deacon on, you better make sure he's not double-tongued. He not to go out here. And matter of fact, if you can't trust him and have some confidence in him to have a tight lip, then you don't need to lay hands on him. That eliminates a lot of people. I'm sorry that it's that way, but don't it, Mark? That eliminates a lot of people. Did you know this? I have never heard this man say anything bad about a person. Never. I'm telling you. You ever been in a conversation somebody be bringing somebody up and you'll say, oh, you know what I mean. I don't mean nothing by it, but yeah, you do, you lying hypocrite. <laughs> out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Josh. That means when it's coming out of the heart and you're saying you don't, you gotta, you gotta convince somebody that the gossip you're spreading, you really don't mean it. No, that's not from God. I'm sorry. Not double-tongued. You can't be one that's always wanting to talk and get on the phone and spread the gossip. Amen? Now, here's another one. Uh, not double tongue, not given to filthy lucre. Now, boy, let me park here on this one for a minute. This means that money doesn't run his life. Hey, look, I had the blessing of a pastor in a church, and we brought a missionary. I didn't bring him in, but he stopped in, Brother Chuck, and he said, uh, he said, now I'm going to be through your way and I'd love to come and report to the church. Now, we can't always let all the missionaries report. We don't have all that kind of money. Matter of fact, I think if a missionary drops in without letting us know, it's kind of rude. Don't get mad at me. If I come over at your house today and don't call you and just show up, what you going to think? It can be. Send a letter. Send a note. What are we going to do when a missionary comes in? We take up an offering, don't we? Yeah. We take up an offering. We try to help them financially, don't we? We can't always do that. But if I know when they're coming, I can let you know. A better man than me hold this opinion. It's common courtesy. If I was going to come by your house, wouldn't you want me to call you, Brother Martin? I might catch you in your comfortable clothing. Oh, what a sight. That ruined me, man. No, but, but what I'm saying is, you'd want to know, wouldn't you? Amen, yes. And all I'm saying is a phone call or a little email or something, it works, goes so far with common courtesy. Amen. That's all I'm saying. The Lord here, he's defining the character of a man. And he says this, not double tongue, not, not given to filthy lucre. That's where I was. By the way, let me say this. I'm a missionary lover. I'm grateful for missionaries. I'm glad that they give their lives to go to foreign soil. And we should. I hope we can take on more and give more money. And I would love to have the, the problem of being able to say, we got money, but we don't have no missionaries. Let's call the mission board. Do you know any missionary? I'd love to have that problem. But this missionary... He was slipping through, and he called me. He said, Brother Chris, well, said, I'm going to be close to your church. Would it be okay to drop in? I said, absolutely, brother. We had he went about the right way is what I was getting at. We would love to have you. Uh, go ahead and, and go down at the bottom of the hill down there and find you. Uh, we, we'll, we'll get you a, a room together and all this. And matter of fact, uh, I thought about it, and I said, now, we do have a parsonage, I mean, a, a, a fellowship hall that has a... Uh, a prophet's chamber's in it. You're welcome to use it. He said, well, I've got to be in another state that night. The man drove like, I don't know if it was from Illinois or somewhere. It was like eight or nine hour drive one way, Brother Martin. And he come all the way in and had a family for a precious family, taking his family to foreign soil. And he came in the minute, Brother Ephraim, that he came in and these deacons saw him and his family, two of them pulled me over to the side. And they said, now, preacher, we want to make something clear here now. We got $50 put back for this guy. We're going to give him $50 this morning. Oh. 
That was the wrong thing to say to me, Brother Edwin. My wife vaguely remembers. I guarantee you she can remember. She remembers well what happened in Transfer. I mean, come on. A guy drives nine hours with four or five children. He's got to turn around and leave to another state. Would you only give him $15? Isn't that stingy? I mean, now we had thousands in the bank. That's stingy. Is it me? Help me out. Is it me or is that stingy? That's stingy, isn't it? It's called filthy lucre. Filthy lucre. Greedy. God hates it. <laughs> was you, you was in the Great Depression, wasn't you? Now, do you know the excuse they gave me? Preacher, you got to understand, we grew up in the Great Depression. And I don't belittle that, don't belittle it. And we just go hold on to every dime we can. I understand that philosophy. Yeah. Nine hours, five children, $50. The math don't add that up. Even that wouldn't even buy his fuel. <laughs> Chuck, I'm liking you more and more, man. I knew you was right for the job. <laughs> Filthy lucre. Can't be greedy. I don't believe Chuck's greedy. Hey, I know he's not. Amen. Filthy Luke, last but not least, here it is now. Let me give you these and we're closing. We're going to the, to the, to the, to the meal time. <clears throat> I wrote this one down. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw two out here and I'm going to give you this one because I've had this problem also. Uh, first of all, God says full of faith. Got to be a man of faith. Has to be a man of faith. He's got to be a man of wisdom. Amen? I mean, if you know anything about Stephen, that tells you the character of a deacon. Stephen gave his life for me. But here's one I want you to uh, look at, and we're going to close. I wrote this thought down. The Lord shared it with me. This man's got to be willing to take responsibility. And I get that from Acts chapter 6 and verse 3 in closing. Seek you out a man who is full of faith, Acts 6 and 3, and full of wisdom, watch this, that we may appoint them over this business. That means that when you take a deacon and you ordain him, along with that office comes responsibility. That's what it means. It means that responsibility. Now, I've had before men who don't want to take responsibility. They don't want to, they, they want the office, but they don't want to stand up and, go, and take what goes along with the office. Let me tell you something. Outside the pastor, the most uncomfortable position in the church is a deacon. There are going to be times that things have to be dealt with. Here these men have to sit down, and you know what they've got to tell these other ladies? Ladies, you're murmuring for no reason. These men are reaching, preaching the word of God and, and they're trying to get in the word of God. Now, if you need something, you're in need, you let us know. We can come and help you. The preacher all the time always correcting everybody. Everybody's going to get mad and not come back, don't want to hear him. And so these men were put in places to deal with problems to bring growth to the church. Now, in closing, here's what he does. Look what happens. Did you realize the minute they done this, Brother Greg, the Bible said the word of God increased. Now what that means is this. That don't mean when they started preaching two more hours, Brother Josh. Said, Man, we don't want the word of God to preach that long. But it meant that the Bible was more soundly studied and more in depth when it was preached. And people were walking away with the word of God rather than a bunch of stories, a bunch of opinions, and a bunch of ideas. They were walking away with the word of God. It had increased in their life. That's what he means. So that's one of the things that happened. When you put a deacon on, he takes the pressure off the pastor and the preacher can study and, and, and preach. And when he does, he has something to say 
And the ideal is that the word of God increases in the lives and hearts of the people. Amen. That was one of the things. Now another one was this. Listen to this one. We hadn't seen this in a while. There was a great number, I believe it is, or multi, uh, a number that submitted to the office of a priest. In other words, when this started happening, men started answering the call to preach. It's in the text. They started, men started standing up. The Bible was doing its job, and the Bible was being preached in clarity, and men started standing up and doing what God wanted them to do. It's in the text. And so it had a ripple effect. So it's just not, it, we're not just, uh, my, 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 my fault this morning is this, we're not just putting a guy on, we're doing it because God said so. And when God says to do something, friend, and you do it, there's benefits from it. You reap good things when you obey God. And so it was this. Uh, the number of disciples was, multitude, was multiplied and a great, a, comp, a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. In other words... When they made this one move, people started getting serious about the things of God because the Bible was preached in depth and in clarity. And God started doing some things. It'd be all right with me if the Lord send us some more deacons, some good qualified deacons and some good qualified people. I'm so glad you're here. Let me ask you to do this. Do I have a motion when we go into conference? I got a motion, Brother Marty, to have a second all in favor of making it known by be raising your right hand if you're a motion. I want, do I have a motion that we now uh, appoint, uh, make Brother Chuck an active head deacon here at Heritage Baptist Church? Do I have a motion? Got a, got a motion, Brother Marty? Got a second? All in favor of making it known by be raising your right hand. Brother Chuck, I love you, friend, and you are very qualified for this position. I'm grateful to have you. Let's make sure you get around to Brother Chuck uh, after, after the dinner, before, just whenever you can, and let him know you appreciate him. And uh, we're going to have a meal. Let's pray and ask God's blessing over the meal, and then you go right on out and go on in there. I know they got it ready for you. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your goodness, your kindness to us. I pray for Brother Chuck, Lord. I pray for our church. I pray you'd send us some more young men. And, Lord, some more young families that just need to get involved in the things of God. Grow our church, Lord, according to the Bible. Thank you for your kindness to us. Bless this meal. Thank you for these ladies, men, that have prepared it. I pray you'd uh, speak to our hearts and uh, help us as we eat. I pray for the next uh, upcoming Lord's Day, Lord, for Thanksgiving meal, God, and the Thanksgiving service. There's something special to us. Use that time. I promise you for all you do, for everything you'll accomplish, we'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Go ahead and be dismissed, and you can get in line. Make sure you hang around for a meal. And uh, I